as the extreme, I would say I'm envious of you. You've observed through Keck. He's observed through the Magellan Telescope in Chile. He's observed through the Hubble Space Telescope. He's observed through Spitzer. In September of 2013, we put out a news release about Trent's work called The Coldest Brown Dwarfs. They blur the line between planets and stars, and I knew I wanted to bring him in here as a speaker for that very reason, and of course, one other. Unlike any other person in this room, and certainly not me, Trent may be the only person that knows how to make Romulan ale. <laughs> Let's ask him afterwards. Trent. <clears throat> That's the problem with being an early adopter of Facebook, I guess. It's information like that gets out there. Um, well, I'm still, it's still just thinking about... Um, about showing the screen, but uh, I guess I can tell you start start telling you a little bit about the uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about I'm just restarting it. So, um, we be talking about spherical balls of gas. Does that make you excited? Is that good? Um, these are special <coughs> spherical balls of gas. Um, as David was saying, they're they almost have what it take takes to be a star, but not quite. So uh, they end up adopting many of the um, attributes that we would normally associate with planets, um, and yet they're, they're wandering the galaxy on their own. They're, they're, they don't have a, a star to call home or anything like that. Uh, and so that's the inspiration for the title of the talk, being cosmic orphans, um, better known as brown dwarfs. So um, <clears throat> who's heard of brown dwarfs before, by the way? Okay, that's about the rate that I see when I like if I meet people on airplanes or at parties, or whatever. Like, <laughs> you have to be pretty nerdy to know what a brown dwarf is, I think. <clears throat> How long have you been studying brown dwarfs? How long have I been? I guess I've basically always been. I mean, since I start, you know, I didn't. I wasn't studying them in high school, but I started studying them in grad school. I guess I never really worked on anything else. Everything went smoothly in the test test runs. Okay, there we go. Well, you'll see this image plenty of other times in the talk, so you don't have to worry about uh, taking it right now. Um, so I just want to start by discussing what a brown dwarf is. I've already sort of alluded to it. But the basic idea is that uh, there's stars that we're all familiar with. This is the closest star to us right now is the sun. Um, and then there's planets. This is the biggest planet we have in the solar system, Jupiter. Um, but out in the galaxy, there's a lot broader spectrum of, of objects. So these are the brown dwarfs. They sit in between the largest planets that we have and, and the stars. Um, and so to put things on a mass scale, if uh, the sun is an elephant, um, brown dwarfs would actually range in size, or mass, I shouldn't say size, so uh, because they're roughly the same size as Jupiter. Um, but in terms of mass, they range from sort of moose, which is uh, about 8% the mass of an elephant, which surprised me at first when I looked that up, but apparently that's correct, uh, and people, human-sized. Um, 
And then on the same scale, say, scale Jupiter would be a small cat. <laughs> okay. So, um, so it's, and it is mass which makes brown dwarf special. Um, and I'll explain why that is. Uh, so this is a cartoon picture of the sun. Uh, we're probably all pretty familiar. There's different regions within the sun. Um, a really important region in the sun is the core. Uh, the core's main job is to hold up the rest of the sun. It has to create enough gas pressure to make sure that the, all the rest of the sun doesn't come collapsing down and turn into a black hole or something like that. Um, and so it has to reach extremely high pressures in order to do this. And uh, you know, if you've learned the ideal gas law in school, the only way you know, for a given volume and density of gas, the way you get more pressure is to turn up the temperature. Uh, and so the temperature that corresponds to the pressure that's needed to hold up the sun is about, uh, here it's in Kelvin units, 15 million. That's about you know, 30 million degrees Fahrenheit or so. And at these sort of very high temperatures, uh, there's a nice uh, natural accident that happens, which is hydrogen turns into helium through nuclear fusion. And that allows energy to be generated uh, and maintain this temperature. If that didn't happen, then, then there would be, it would, the sun would run out of energy and collapse on itself. Okay. Um, so brown dwarfs, on the other hand, uh, are less massive. Right? They're much, they, don't have, they don't have to worry about holding up as much mass as the sun does. And so the pressure in their core is much lower because it doesn't have to be high enough to hold up lots of mass. And what that means is the temperature is also much lower. Um, and brown dwarfs, basically, you, when you become a brown dwarf is when your core is below about 5 million degrees Fahrenheit. Below that temperature, you don't have the, the gas is not hot enough to have nuclear fusion. Um, and so there is no energy generated. Uh, you just gradually, you, you can still support, the, the gas can still support the brown dwarf. Um, but as, it, as it's radiating away energy at the surface, that pre, you know, the, the, star can, the brown dwarfs sort of continually contract. Um, they're actually supported a bit by electron degeneracy pressure, and that's why they don't uh, you know, plummet into themselves. They sort of gradually contract over their lifetime. Um, and as that's happening, uh, they're, they're getting cooler. So as I say, they're, they're, losing, they're just losing the energy that they started off with, and they have no way to replace it. And so uh, from the core all the way up to the surface, everything is getting cooler. Uh, and so I'll refer to this quite a few times throughout the talk. So as time goes on, the surface temperature of brown dwarfs is getting, is getting much lower. And so this is one of the key traits of, of brown dwarfs. And, and why I, uh, they end up being pretty interesting objects. Um, and so another tr uh, consequence of this trait is that they, after having a brief period of time in their youth where they're extremely bright and putting off lots of energy, um, they actually get cold enough to where they don't put out very much visible light at all. So you can't see them in the visible. Um, you know, you're, even if you have like a CCD camera on your telescope, it's going to be essentially impossible to find a brown dwarf that you would actually be able to detect uh, with, your cam with, your, with your telescope. Um, we can see them with the, some of the largest telescopes, uh, but they primarily put off their light in the infrared. And so this, this is supposed to be a little cartoon to describe you know, what brown dwarfs would look like. Uh, if we turned off all the lights and all the light sources in this room and shut, shut out all the windows, we wouldn't be able to see each other. Um, because our eyes, our eyes work at wavelengths where we can't detect each other's light. But if we had infrared eyes, we would all be glowing because we all, we're all, we all have some heat. And so you know, our faces would be warmer than our clothes and things like that. Um, and so just for the same reason, brown dwarfs are glowing too. We just don't see them in the visible. Uh, and so it was this sort of problem when scientists sort of started thinking about um, what to call these objects. There was lots of names being thrown around. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that the brown dwarf so it was created in the 70s uh, by Joel Tarter, um, who is more famous nowadays for um, being one of the co-founders of the SETI Institute. Um, some of you may know her, her the character of Ellie uh, Arroway or something in Contact. Jodie Foster's character in Contact was, was based on Jill Tarter. And you can see Jill Tarter is using the real thing. Jill Tarter is using computers here, not headphones. That's the, <laughs> this is the standard, standard joke. So, 
So, but Jill was interested in brown dwarfs because at the time, we scientists or astronomers started no, finding out that there was some missing mass out in the universe. Um, nowadays, we call this dark matter. It's sort of a well-accepted fact. Um, and so one of the ideas was it could be brown dwarfs because they didn't put out any visible light. And so she, she wrote her thesis on this stuff, and she proposed this term brown dwarf because, well, they weren't quite red dwarfs, so they weren't stars, but they weren't completely black either. They weren't totally without light. And so brown was sort of somewhere between red and black. And besides, no one really knew what colors they were going to be anyway. Um, so that was it. Um, and of course, nowadays we know actually they do range, the, since they change so much over their lifetimes, they go through all sorts of different colors and everything. So um, they're not just one color. Uh, the term brown dwarf really just sort of applies to the fact that they're glowing balls of gas that don't have stable, stable energy generation and stable colors and, and brightnesses throughout their lives. Um, so she was interested mainly in the missing mass, but I think there's all sorts of other interesting things as well about brown dwarfs. So one is, where do they come from? Do they actually form like stars do? Does nature just make them naturally, just like it makes stars like the sun? Uh, and if so, how common are they? Are they more common than the sun? Are they less common? Um, and if you could go to them, what would they be like? Uh, what kind of worlds are they? Do they, do they look like planets like Jupiter? Do, what, what sort of things? Um, are going on in their atmospheres, uh, and finally, if they really, if they're, if you think of them as tiny stars, then maybe they have planets themselves. And what would life like be uh, on one of those planets orbiting a brown dwarf? So I'll start off by just uh, discussing where they come from. So do do they form like stars or not? This is, of course, they come from the same place that everything, uh, stars and planets, everything we normally think of, everything comes from these star forming regions. Uh, you can see dark. Dark regions of uh, cold gas that are blocking out the stars behind the star forming region. Um, you can see other areas um, where bright stars have formed and have started ionizing the gas, and so you can see through the gas. Um, so the question is, right, are they forming on their own in these little dark globules of, of material, or are they forming around stars and somehow getting off out into the universe on their own, or, or something like that? So to start off with, I'll show you. Um, you know, we obviously don't get to observe stars forming in real time. So to imagine it, we have simulations where we can start with uh, gas simulated in a computer, and we can watch it evolve over millions of years. So that's what I'll show you next. So this is a ball of gas that is allowed to have the normal properties we see in, in uh, gas clouds in the galaxy, turbulent motions in the interior of the, of the, the cloud, and these turbulent motions put parcels of gas in contact with each other, and they ram up against each other and, and shock, create shock waves and radiate away energy. And that, you know, you're spewing energy out and allowing the gas to cool down and, and form clumps. And once you have allowed enough gravitational energy to escape, um, these clumps become self-gravitating, and they start forming stars, which you can see is these bright dots flying around. Um, and in these simulations, uh, one of the key attributes is that you see stars escaping from the star forming region. Uh, according to these simulations, it's very common for uh, some stars to stay in the nebula and other stars to get ejected through dynamical interactions with um, the rich environment of stars. Uh, for context, this, this whole uh, movie is only um, about three light years across, so the distance between us and Alpha Centauri or so. Um, so very, very dense environment. We don't, we don't live in an environment like this um, where we live in the galaxy. Um, but when stars are born and when the sun was born, we probably did. <coughs> so uh, in the simulation, you can't tell from which, you can't tell different dots apart, obviously. But some of these dots in the simulation turn out to be brown dwarf masses. So they can be very low mass objects in addition to stars like the sun. So this simulation would say that, sure, we can form brown dwarfs on their own. Um, now to explore the other aspect, uh, if we look around any one of these stars, they should have a disk of material, protoplanetary disk. This is the sort of thing we think the planets in the solar system formed out of, a flattened gaseous uh, disk with dust in it and planetesimals and that sort of thing. Um, and so now we can ask the question of, uh, what if we look at one of these disks and we allow there to be a lot of gas, more gas than we think was in the actual solar nebula that formed our solar system. But we just turn that up by a factor of 10 or something and see what happens. So here's another simulation um, coming in from the top. We've zoomed in now on this disk. So there's nice little spiral arms 
forming the, uh, what we're looking at here is the gas uh, in this one of these circumstellar disks. And you can see as those spirals form and within them, there's little clumps of gas that cool down and become little self-gravitating things. So some of these things will become planets, uh, and some of them are very ma would be essentially very very massive planets, um, planets that are 80 times bigger than Jupiter, say, um, and that would qualify them as a brown dwarf. And yet they formed here in this you know co you know this um, flat. Does some of them form little binary pairs? Um, <clears throat> and so the question is, you know, is this the one? Is this really the dominant way that we form uh, brown dwarfs, or is it? Do they just collapse down on their own and without any help from any star nearby? <clears throat> so to answer that, um, this is this just to, to illustrate this. So the question is whether whether they collapse on their own. This is an actual image of um, such a, a core. Uh, this is an image of cold gas. Uh, detected in the ra in radio emission, um, and this cold gas, we can measure how much mass is there, and it's only about 30 Jupiter masses. So this is something that will become a brown dwarf one day. It's still forming, uh, and then we also sometimes see brown dwarfs around stars like this. So um, the question is, which of these two modes is more common? And so first, I guess I should um, step back for a moment and describe how we find brown dwarfs. So it's probably no surprise that the key way, and I guess I've already kind of alluded to it, is uh, using infrared uh, cameras to do this. So nowadays, this is very common. Like it, most of you probably in this room realize that you can go out and buy infrared goggles or whatever. Um, when Jill Tarter was doing her thesis, you know, I don't think there was maybe one pixel infrared cameras that, and now we have you know infrared cameras that have as many pixels as uh, CCD cameras do in the visible. And so uh, it's really been, you know, over the course of my lifetime, technology has developed such that we can now survey the sky in infrared wavelengths in ways that we hadn't been able to before. So one of the first big surveys to do this was the two micron all sky survey. Uh, so it's called two microns because that's the wavelength that it's observing at. Uh, for reference, our eyeballs sort of see 0.3 to 0.9 microns or so. Um, so it's a little bit <clears throat> further in the red than, than our eyeballs see. Uh, and this is a map of the entire sky. So you can obviously see the Milky Way very prominently in the center. Um, the large Magellanic Cloud is sort of down to the right here, a small Magellanic Cloud. Uh, and you can also see just lots and lots of stars. <clears throat> and so two Micronaut Sky Survey, or two mass, as people like me call it, two mass created this great infrared atlas of stars. And this is how some of the first brown dwarfs were discovered. Um, and very recently, this has been complemented. We've actually been, we've gone even deeper uh, and found even colder brown dwarfs by doing this survey, this sort of survey in space. So this was done from the ground. Um, but the problem is, if you go farther out to longer wavelengths than this, uh, the sky starts to glow. Your telescope starts to glow, just like the picture of the people sitting in the room. Uh, if, the, if your telescope is glowing, it's going to be very, very hard to see faint things in the sky, and if the sky is glowing. So the way you get around that is you go to space, you put a satellite that orbits the Earth. Um, there was a satellite called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. It was in a polar orbit around the Earth, so it was going over the South Pole and the North Pole. <clears throat> and so by doing that, over six months, it was able to map the entire sky uh, at longer infrared wavelengths than we had done before. Uh, and so this allowed us to probe even deeper and see really the coldest brown dwarfs that are in the uh, solar neighborhood, the area that's, that's right in our, in our little neighborhood of the galaxy. And so this was only a few years ago. Um, and so now I'll show you what's, what we know about uh, our neighborhood now. So here is a little rotating movie of just the volume of, if you look out in 32 light years in every direction around the sun, what do you find? And every little dot here is a star or a brown dwarf. Um, the ones with numbers next to them are, I believe, binary or trip, you know, in various. If it's got a two, it's a binary system. If it's got a p next to the number, then it's a. Uh, it's got some planets. Uh, got some extrasolar planets. Um, but the important thing here is just to know that you know we have a nice census of everything that's in our neighborhood, um, and now we've pushed it down far enough to see where all the brown dwarfs are as well. So now we can ask the question, how common are brown dwarfs pre-floating on their own when we look around us? <clears throat> and so here's what happens if you just count up the number of different types of objects. 
Uh, here they're broken down into spectral types. You don't really have to worry about that, but you know, one of these bins is uh, sort of sun-like stars. Uh, the one down here is uh, are the brown dwarfs. The, this really big one are the M dwarfs, or the, the red dwarfs. <clears throat> they're kind of the most common stars in the galaxy. Um, and so what you see here basically is that stars in the galaxy follow essentially what's a bell curve or a Gaussian distribution. So it's the same sort of bell curve that you know there's really intelligent people, there's sort of average intelligent people, and there's only you know a few people who are really do really really you know bomb the SAT, which is what this this plot is showing. Um, I won't tell you where my SAT score is, but it, according to this, I probably wouldn't have gotten into Harvard. So, um, so we can do the same thing for stars. And the bell curve of stars looks something like this. The sun is actually a little bit above average. Um, red dwarfs are really, really common. Red dwarfs are smaller than the sun. So the sun's on the, the high side of the distribution. But brown dwarfs are way down here on the, on the really uncommon side of things. <coughs> Um, and so I can also show you, this is another diet way of looking at this. Uh, inside this box are all those stars from the previous little rotating movie. And here are the brown dwarfs that are in that same volume of space. So if you count up all these stars and you count up the brown dwarfs, what you see is that there are about 25 stars for every brown dwarf. <coughs> um, so we can go back to this question of how often do brown dwarf stars form on their, their own. Um, and it looks like roughly the, that, ratio, that rate is about 25 to 1 compared to sun-like stars. So then we can ask, uh, there's been other surveys that have gone out and looked around all the, all the stars that are near us to see if there's any brown dwarfs around them. We can ask how often does that happen? And that answer is about 100 to 1. So it turns out brown dwarfs are much more common to be found free-floating on their own in the galaxy than they are bound to a, another star. And so we, it's, some people will still actually debate about this. I've given you my perspective. Some people will say, well, the ones that are free-floating actually started out around stars, but they got ejected. Um, and if you remember from that movie I showed you, the blue movie, there were some little brown dwarfs that got, got thrown out. <clears throat> but my opinion is that the evidence shows that they probably formed more like stars. Um, and, and when they do that, they're pretty uncommon outcomes. Uh, of star formation. So what do these sort of rare, small things look like if you could actually go there? Well, as I mentioned before, they're always cooling down. So what they look like will depend on what age you happen to be looking at of the object. Um, <clears throat> but let's just do a comparison between, on the left, a uh, what's called a mature brown dwarf. I guess they don't like to be called old. And then Jupiter's on the right, um, which Jupiter would be a mature giant planet. Um, five billion years old or so. So uh, I should say the dotted line here that's, that's horizontal, that's essentially what we would call the surface. That's what if you went to that object and you looked at it, things above that line are things you would see with your eyes or with the telescope. Um, and things below it would be sort of hidden from view. But, but they would be there <coughs> if you could actually probe down into the atmosphere. So of course, neither of these things have a, a rocky surface. We don't know if Jupiter has a core or not. Um, but, uh, and we're not even looking that, that low down. So for the brown dwarf, um, you have above the surface, you have a mixture of methane and carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is the toxic, tox, toxic gas that you're not supposed to run your car in your garage with the door closed. Um, <clears throat> sulfides are basically, I think they're basically the stuff that rotten eggs smell like. That's what, that's what makes eggs, rotten eggs smell bad. Um, those would be sulfides. And there would be sulfide clouds in this brown dwarf uh, above the surface. And then just below the surface, you would actually have um, clouds of various silicates. So magnesium silicates in include things like talc. Uh, i trying to think there's some other, like peridot, I think, is a magnesium silicate. And then you have this iron rain. So you have liquid iron droplets. Um, and so you could imagine some sort of iron hydrological cycle, but with iron. Um, and then below that, you have more minerals and things. Um, so the, this is what brown dwarfs. They, love, they have lots of mineral clouds. Um, so corundum. Does anyone know what uh, crystallized corundum is normally called? Ruby? Ruby? That's, uh, that's, right. one, that's one of them. Um, sapphires also. It depends on what impurities are in it. But, so you have clouds of you know, ruby, sapphire type stuff, except they're not in crystalline form. So you have to cool it down. <clears throat> so in comparison. 
you know, Jupiter essentially shows some of the same traits, but the sulfide clouds are way below the surface. Um, and then it's even cooler at its, at its surface. And so you get clouds of ammonia uh, and water. And then above that, it's mostly methane. And there's a little bit of um, carbon monoxide. Um, and then in both of these objects, there's actually some mixing that's going on. In Jupiter, it's, most, it's all below the surface. We don't see a lot of the mixing right, right where we can see it on the surface. Uh, but in the brown dwarfs, actually, uh, it's expected that there's actually <coughs> convective motions bringing up. And this, this is why you get carbon monoxide above the surface of brown dwarfs. You get this hot gas coming from below and coming above the surface, and, and everything sort of gets mixed all together. <coughs> So now I'll compare a brown dwarf to a, an object of the same temperature. So this would be an, an old, massive brown dwarf compared to a younger, lower mass uh, giant planet, still several times the size of Jupiter. Um, and you can see essentially it's a similar thing. The, um, <clears throat> some of the clouds that are below the surface for the, the brown dwarf uh, are higher up in the atmosphere for the, for the planet. Um, and so. One of the things I think is interesting about this is, you know, both of these slides sort of highlight the fact that brown dwarfs and planets have a lot of the same sort of cloud stuff going on. Um, they all, they both have mixing, but everything, and but things vary depending on whether you look at different temperatures and at different um, different masses. So let's go back to the surface. This is what the surface of Jupiter looks like if you go if you look in the um, thermal infrared. So this sort of long wavelengths I was talking about. Um, going to space to see. And so what you see here, the main thing you see are right, these bands. So you can see, you see bands in the clouds of Jupiter when you look at it um, you know, from ground-based telescope uh, through the eyepiece. But in the infrared, you see the same thing. And, and what uh, the darker regions will correspond to essentially thick cloud decks that are blocking our view of the deeper, hotter gas that's inside the planet. Um, this, this little circle with the dot on it is uh, actually shows you where Galileo, the Galileo uh, probe, space probe, uh, flew into Jupiter and into its life, uh, actually happened to be in one of these hot spots. So it went through a fairly cloud-free region and went straight into the, the hot gas interior. So uh, and it just so happens this image does not include the great red spot. So to show you that, <clears throat> here's a thermal image of the, the great red spot on Jupiter. And so as you might expect, the great spot is a is a great storm, and so that storm is made of these have have these cl uh, thick, high cloud decks, and so the red spot is actually very dark in the infrared <coughs> because of that, because it's blocking our view. So, um, what if we went to uh, people who started looking at brown dwarfs to see if they vary in brightness? So, if brown dwarfs had great storms like the red spot. Um, what you might see is you would see a dark, this dark storm region come across and uh, cause the light from the brown dwarf to dim a little bit. And then the storm would go back on the other side of the brown dwarf as it rotates. And then it would, the brown dwarf would get a little bit brighter. Um, and the expectation was that if you had something like the Great Red Spot, it's about 1% the surface of Jupiter. So you would only see variations in brightness by about 1%. Uh, and for a long time, people couldn't find any variations. But that 1% is pretty hard to do for brown dwarfs. Um, but recently, people have started finding brown dwarfs that are varying by 10 times that. Um, and so there are some brown dwarfs that we know of now that may look something more like this, where there's a really huge storm on the surface that's covering a very large fraction of, of the surface of the brown dwarf um, with just incredibly high winds or, or all sorts of other things going on. Uh, and so in, in some of the brown dwarfs we know now may have uh, great red spots that are 10 times bigger than the ones that we see on Jupiter, but not all of the brown dwarfs. So uh, if we do see storms on brown dwarfs, what else might we see? Well, some people have started <coughs> uh, playing with models and finding that they actually see uh, electrostatic you know, discharges within the atmospheres of brown dwarfs, implying that there's actually could be um, these energetic lightning type events happening inside the brown dwarf. And so um, if you're familiar with the Miller-Urey experiment way back that basically showed if you had some basic molecules lying around and you just zapped it with electricity, you could create the building blocks of life. And this was sort of one of the early explanations for how, how the, the young Earth um, was able to get things like amino acids um, seemingly out of nowhere. And so there's now this suggestion floating around that 
that maybe inside the atmospheres of brown dwarfs, you have all sorts of molecules available to you, molecules and different types of minerals. And so you could potentially create all sorts of different types of complex organic uh, molecules like amino acids um, if there's these sort of lightning storms happening. Uh, and so this you know, reminds me of the, the concept of life in Jupiter. Carl Sagan had proposed the idea that you, know, you don't really need a rocky surface to have life. We like to think of that, but you could have things floating around in the atmosphere, um, provided you had the right ingredients to create such creatures. right? And so. Um, it may be the case that brown dwarfs could have, they have, if they have the ingredients for life within them, you could have things floating around living there. But what about normal type of life? Uh, this is you know, another artist's conception of what it would be like to be on a rocky world you know, with a nice liquid water lake, uh, water you could actually drink, but instead of having a sun, you'd have this big, it would be big in your sky because you'd have to be close enough to it to have liquid water. Um, big uh, brown dwarf as your sun instead. Well, when we look at young brown dwarfs, we see plenty of evidence that they have disks, these flat disks, like I was referring to earlier, with lots of gas and rocks floating around. Um, people have detected millimeter-sized particles inside brown dwarf disks. And so there's no reason to think that brown dwarfs don't have the building blocks of planets uh, when they're, as they're forming. And this goes along with the idea that brown dwarfs form just like stars. It's just that they never quite get enough mass to, to have fusion. <clears throat> so if you want to have life around a star, uh, there's this concept of the habitable zone. We're in it, obviously, the Earth is. Uh, we're just right. We, we're not so hot that all the oil, oceans um, oil off the surface and escape. And we're not so cold that all the water is locked up into ice, like you see in the um, you know, some of the moons around the outer planets. There's plenty of ice there, but there's not a lot of liquid water, except perhaps under the, the subsurface oceans of maybe Europa and some of the other satellites. <clears throat> um, but in terms of having liquid water on the surface, this is what scientists, astronomers, this is what we, we know that life can exist under these conditions. So this is what we often think about when we talk about habitability. Um, so it, here's the thing, right? Stars are different sizes, different temperatures. Um, more massive, brighter stars, the habitable zone will be farther away because you don't want to get too close to it because it's too hot. The really smaller, much smaller stars you have to huddle up closer to in order to get the warmth that you need to keep water liquid. Um, and and uh, so what this means is that the habitable zone around something like a brown dwarf will be exponentially closer to the surface of the brown dwarf than, than we are from the sun. Um, so just to give you an idea, so. For sort of typical temper temperatures for brown dwarfs, as brown dwarfs get older, um, a young brown dwarf, you know, you might want to be a million miles away from the surface in order to be the right temperature. But then a billion years later, you'd need to move closer. You need to be only 300,000 miles away. And then, you know, toward the end of the brown, or I shouldn't say the end of its life, it'll live forever. But several billion years in the future, um, you'd want to be only 80,000 miles away. So 80,000 miles is pretty close. To put things in perspective, does anybody know how far away the moon is in miles? Yeah, 200,000 miles. I always remember that because my uh, a physics professor I had in college told me just how many miles he got out of some car that he owned. So that's roughly the, the right distance to the moon. Um, so you're talking about you need to be closer to this brown dwarf surface than the moon is to the Earth uh, in order to actually gather the heat. But that's not the problem. I'll explain. There's actually a bigger problem here. And that is that if we imagine a nice, cozy, habitable planet today around a brown dwarf that is, let's just say it's roughly the age, same age as the solar system. <clears throat> what if we look back two billion years ago? Well, the brown dwarf was younger, it was hotter, brighter, and so the habitable zone was a little further away. This planet would be right near the edge. Um, now the Earth in the solar system actually ha happens to be near the edge of, depending on how you compute the habitable zone, some people will tell you the Earth is pretty close to the inner edge, so maybe this is okay. But then if you go back to the beginning of its life, this planet would have been toasted so much that it wouldn't be able to retain any water on its surface. <clears throat> and so really what you see today, there'd be no way to actually have liquid on the surface because it would have undergone this epoch in the past of, of intense radiation from the brown dwarf. And so this is why uh, it's very hard to imagine there being habitable planets around brown dwarfs. You basically have to 
either you have to move your planets around within the system, which uh, if you're just trying to get life started, which can take a billion years, on the Earth it took a billion years before we saw any you know, signs, of, signs of life on the Earth, and then another you know, three billion years or so until you got the life that sort of we think of, the sort of swimming, crawling, flying life. Um, but even just getting single-celled organisms took, took a long time. And so life has to evolve really, really rapidly, rapidly on brown dwarfs if it's going to exist, and then it's going to have to move. Um, so that is uh, basically the, a lot of the stuff that I find really interesting about these objects. Um, they seem to be made by nature, very small. Nature puts them out in the, in the galaxy with no way to really fend for themselves or provide for themselves. And so they just go colder and fainter over time. Of course, nature doesn't do that very often. These, things are, these types of objects are, are actually fairly rare in the galaxy. Um, but if, and if you could visit them, they might not be very friendly to our type of life. The clouds are, the, the atmosphere is full of all sorts of poisonous gas, and, uh, and you probably wouldn't want to be breathing in minerals either. Um, and possibly extremely stormy, um, with storms that are 10 times bigger than, than you see on Jupiter in the Great Red Spot. Um, and the life there would have a really hard time forming and you know, existing long enough to get to the point where they could you know, talk to us or something like that. Thanks. Thank you, Trent. We will take a few questions as soon as I find my microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. All right, take a few questions. Right over here, please. Any chance of a brown dwarf scooting around the galaxy and finding a gas cloud and then hovering up? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the question was, can a brown dwarf acquire some mass later on in its life somehow, maybe by swinging through some gas cloud and picking up just enough mass? Um, Certainly objects really near the limit, you could imagine that might happen occasionally, because gas clouds are very big and uh, stars like the sun, you know, we, we, the solar system has orbited the galaxy, oh, I don't know, 40 times, 40 times, 40 times? No, 40 times, 16 times or something since we formed. So there's lots of opportunities for you to encounter gas. Um, I would think maybe a more likely scenario would be some sort of collision of brown dwarfs in a cluster or something like that, where you, you have a much more dense environment and two brown dwarfs might actually join up one day, combine their mass and create a star. We have a question over here. Um, so what's the closest brown dwarf to either this galaxy or even to Earth? I don't know. The question is, what's the closest brown dwarf to Earth? That is another interesting question. I would have had a totally different answer for you if you asked me that a year ago. But there was just a pair of brown dwarfs found uh, two parcels, six light years away, something like that. So really, it's like the third or fourth <coughs> closest stellar system to the sun. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. But we just added, you know, basically the only things closer to us, I think, are um, Alpha Centauri and like Barnard Star. And so. There was some. There was a pair of brown dwarfs right there, and these. This is one of the ones actually that has this huge storm on it. Um, yeah. So the problem and the reason why it wasn't found for such a long time, you would think the closest ones would be really bright, so you see them. But they're they're so close that they're moving really fast on the sky because um, everything sort of moves has its own motions and <coughs> they're really zipping by us. Another question, way in the back. On the first picture of your show, that Paul created the bar. Was not symmetrical. It was like a drop of water. It's the energy, not uniform. It's not symmetrical. Are you talking about the image that I showed up yes. there? Okay, the question is why was not that <laughs> bubble uniform <laughs> had an asymmetrical to it? Because the star is spinning. And when you get angular motion and material is thrown out, it may be a little bit unequal on one side. It's also running into matter that is out there, some of these dark clouds that we're talking about, and coming up against them and lighting up. So at that point, that cloud is so huge. It may have started out quite spherical, but as it's moved out, 
That's why it has that beautiful teardrop shape. Question over here. Yes, young man. What's the largest storm on a brown dwarf or Jupiter? On a brown dwarf. What is the largest storm on a brown dwarf? Um, well, we're still looking for them, but I guess the, the, the biggest ones we found, we've seen some that would be truly like the, almost a third of the surface of the, the, the brown dwarf, if that's what it is. There could be other explanations for besides storms, but they could take up almost the entire surface of the planet, basically. <coughs> I don't know, that doesn't make sense. Not the entire surface, but you know what I mean. Like, a large, large fraction. Okay, we've got a question up front. Related to that, um, how fast would the winds or whatever the kind of movement would be, how fast could it possibly be in those massive storms? How fast would the winds be blowing in those massive storms? So I've heard sort of tornado type speeds, like 100 to 400 miles per hour. Um, that's not really my area, so I don't know, but um, I heard that claimed. Tornado size speeds over size that's the size of the Earth. That's fast, but remember <laughs> the tops of the clouds on Venus are ripping along at 2,000 miles an hour. Fast. Yes, question. You mentioned, and during your talk, you mentioned that we don't know if Jupiter has a core. Mm. Why did we not know? The data are can be consistent with either a core or uh, dense gas, basically. So some of the same models that we use for the brown dwarfs uh, we use for Jupiter, and so we don't full, people don't fully understand exactly, um, it's called the equation of state, basically how dense does the gas get as you go down. Um, we've sent probes to Jupiter. You can usually measure, we've measured a core in Saturn where you can see a sharp change between the gas and the rock uh, in density. But for Jupiter, no one's seen this sharp change yet. And so but it still could be there. Question up above in the balcony. Can, do we know anything about their ages? Do we think some of them were created early in the, uh, you know, early after the, the Big Bang? Do we know anything about brown dwarfs' ages? We have brown dwarfs of all ages for you. There's, um, <laughs> there's some that are very old. They seem to be extremely uh, lacking in metals and things in their atmosphere. And they're on, uh, they just happen to be passing through the solar neighborhood and they're, they're on these big galactic orbits. So they're part of the halo. There's a few halo brown dwarfs known. They just happen to be living right next to us right now, but in a few million years they'll be gone. So we have halo brown dwarfs that are you know, as old as the galaxy probably. Um, and then we have really young ones near us Certainly, there's, we see the ones that are just as they're forming, and then we have even ones in the near the sun that are only 10 million years old. They've just probably, maybe they're still forming planets and things like that. All right, we'll take our last question right here, young lady. What are the size ranges of brown dwarfs? Because um, you know our sun is a medium-sized star. Could there be a brown dwarf that's the size of our sun? Can brown dwarfs uh, be as large as our sun in diameter, which would be about a million miles in diameter? Uh, when they're young, yes. I'll just comment that brown dwarfs actually uh, are all essentially roughly the same size as Jupiter, within about 15%. Whether you're the moose mass or the human mass, um, they're all about the same size, or whether the, you're the cat mass. So brown dwarfs are uh, incredibly dense compared to Jupiter. They're the same size, but much more massive. Um, but when they're young and they're still contracting, uh, people actually measured uh, an eclipsing binary system of brown dwarfs, so they measured the radius, and it's uh, a little bit more than half the size of the sun. So, m really puffed up. And certainly, when they're a bit younger, they'd be even they could be even bigger than the sun when they're very, very young. We'd like to thank Trent B for joining us. Remember, please join us February. Thursday of the month here in Cambridge.